All right, let's get started with the event for today. Of course, I want to, to welcome and thank for having uh, Tak Furimoto uh, to give us this talk again. This is the second time he uh, has graciously come to Hunter College and spoken to us about his life and experiences. Um, so thank you very much for coming again. Um, but yes, uh, Mr. Tak Furimoto is the president and CEO of Furimoto Realty. Uh, and he's here to share his personal experiences and his life as both a um, survivor uh, of the Japanese internment camps in America during World War II, uh, the aftermath of the atomic bombing in Hiroshima, um, and then becoming a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War. Um, and, you know, as well as speaking about a lot of the uh, current issues uh, surrounding Asian Americans and, and hate crimes against them. Uh, so welcome talk again, uh, and I'll just let you get started. I'll pull up the presentation as well. Thank you, April, for the introduction. Uh, greetings to everybody. This is my second time back, as uh, April said. Today, i like to share uh, my experiences. Uh, this year marks 80th year uh, of Executive Order 9066, which was signed by President Roosevelt back in February 19 of 1942, uh, which had sent 120,000 innocent Japanese American, two thirds were Americans to the internment camp for the duration of the war, which was close to uh, four years. Now, I prepared 33 slides today, uh, some pictures, uh, some documentary pictures, and some documents uh, so that you could more vividly understand what went on. And uh, hopefully at the end, we have a dialogue and question and answers, and you have a very good, interesting questions for me. As uh, you see the first, uh, the slide, it says Japanese segregation camp. And this is what I'll be talking about the most. And I also uh, have experience in Hiroshima atomic bomb. Uh, four months after uh, we were rele uh, released from the camp, uh, our family went back to Hiroshima, Japan, and we saw the aftermath. And today with the Russia and Ukraine <clears throat> conflict, maybe a good subject to talk about this today also. In Vietnam War, uh, of course, uh, uh, since they're having a war right now and I could kind of get into what war is like a little bit, uh, but the, most of my topic will be on uh, <coughs> segregation camp. But also at the end, I would like to talk about what's going on today with the Asian American hate crime. Uh, during my 77 years, uh, I had experienced three major uh, hate crimes. Uh, first was the Executive Order 9066. Even today, we feel some of the after effects of that. And second was uh, late 1980s, uh, early 1990s, when Japanese had bought the United States like golf courses, Pebble Beach Golf Courses, Rockefeller Center. There was a amount of jealousy and we, we were again, target of hate crime. And now, uh, as you know, with, with the current uh, coronavirus uh, uh, hate crime that's going on, which is really uh, lasted a long time and it's how they speak now, but so these are the things that I would like to talk about. Uh, so April, could you uh, start flipping the uh, uh, slides, please? Well, stand up for what is right. And this is what I'm trying to do so that no other Americans will suffer or fright of what Japanese American has suffered, being innocent, have done nothing for just being a Japanese American. But we have to stand up and fight for our constitution and civil liberties. And this is what I wanna talk about today. 
Okay, April next. Okay, this is a guard tower. This is Turtle Lake Segregation Center. This is place where I was born. There were 10 of these. It took about six months for each uh, camp to be built, surrounded by barbed wire. The question that I get most is that, was that uh, guard or man? And was, it, uh, was there a, a weapon on there? Yes, there was a machine gun facing at us. There was a sentry there with a rifle. In fact, uh, uh, people asked, was the live ammunition ever used? Yes, in 1944, May, six months before I was born, this gentleman named James Okamura, uh, he was about to take a truck to go work outside the camp. He was a little tardy and started to chase the camp and he was shot uh, from the back and following day he died. The guard was exonerated. Yes, it did happen, uh, but this is where everything happened for me until today. Okay, next please. This is uh, Executive Order 9066, which uh, President Roosevelt uh, had signed in February 19, 1942. What this did was that 120 Japanese innocent, two third American citizens were placed in the internment camp throughout the remote areas of the United States. And they, they gave us actually 10 days notice in one carry on suitcase per person to go into that camp. I don't know how in the world that this happened but it did happen in American soil, in our country, not in North Korea, not in Nazi Germany, but this happened in this country and we were locked up for close to four years. I wanna make sure that no other Americans has to go through this. Uh, now, I'll, I'll get into this more in detail, but this, uh, <clears throat> I want to say uh, what the fabricated report was given to Supreme Court saying that the Japanese Americans were menaced to United States. Well, they found out 30, 35 years later in 1978, quite by accident. Uh, next page, please. I'm gonna go to that person right now. Uh, Aiko Herzak Yoshinaga in 1978, uh, she happened to be working in Washington, D.C., and she was a wife to a colonel, a army officer, and who was very uh, knowledgeable about the internment camp. And she found a document saying that uh, the Japanese Americans were not. Uh, <clears throat> not menace to the West Coast of the United States. This was key in proving that the government has submitted a false and manipulated record to the Supreme Court in order to justify its actions. When the officials at that time called the War Department discovered what the General DeWitt original report contradicted the government's position, they had General DeWitt revised his report. The department ordered copies of a destroyed and re revised version was given to the Supreme Court. And she was able to discover and recognize one copy of the original report that had not been destroyed, helping to demonstrate the decision to remove Japanese Americans was based on racism, not military necessity. Uh, a few minutes later, I will be reading the apology letter uh, that was sent to me in 1993 by uh, President Clinton. The Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was signed by Reagan, but it took about five years 
for us to get the apology letter together with the reparation of $20,000. Uh, by the way, I was able to meet uh, Aiko Herzaki Yoshinaga. She was 93 years old, about a month before she passed away in San Pedro, California. We were able to listen to her story, how she had discovered this uh, report. Uh, and at the end, what she told me, there was uh, myself, my wife, uh, my best friend, and his wife also, like me, was born in a camp. She called two of us together and said, Tak and Irene, but they, by, by they, the US government, that to us was criminal. So I could still remember her last words. After the September 11, 2001 attacks, immigrants are again being branded as danger to the countries. Minority communities continue to experience discrimination, hostility, hate, and Supreme Court in the tribal ban case recently has deferred to the president actions carried out in the name of national security. Even in the face of evidence, that were motivated by prejudice. Now, let me, uh, okay, uh, next please, uh, April. Now, let me read the letter I received from uh, President Clinton. As I said, I took five years from President Reagan to Bush Sr. Uh, to uh, President Bill Clinton. We got this letter based on the fact that uh, the fabricated report was discovered. And it took a while, but we're able to get apology letter and Civil Liberties Act of 1988 was signed. Let me read this letter because this is very important. Probably this is the crux of today's uh, lecture. The White House, Washington, October 1st, 1993. Over 50 years ago, the United States government unjustly in turn evacuated or relocated you and many other Japanese Americans. Today, on behalf of your fellow Americans, I offer sincere apology to you for the action that unfairly denied Japanese Americans, their families, fundamental liberties during World War II. In passing the Civil Liberties Act of 1988, we acknowledge the wrongs of the past and offer redress to those who endure such grave injustice. In retrospect, we understand that the nation's action were rooted deeply in the racial prejudice, wartime hysteria, and lack of political leadership. We must learn from the past and dedicate ourselves as a nation to renewing the spirit of equality and the love of freedom. Together, we can guarantee a future with liberty and justice for all. You and your family have my best wishes for the future. Unfortunate thing is it took Supreme Court 76 years from 1942 to 2018 to uh, say that executive order 9066 was unconstitutional. This was just a letter to pacify us and $20,000 uh, uh, reparation payment. But uh, I mean, this is uh, uh, ridiculous, but it did happen in this country. The thing that uh, I re regret the most uh, when we received this letter and the reparation, 50% of people did not receive this letter. They had passed away and they did not, did not receive reparation. So the surviving people who were in turn were the only ones that got it. But the fact that my, my parents, my mother died in 1972, my father died in 1983, then were not able to read this apology letter. And, and I'm so sad that they didn't. Uh, it could, you know, uh, they were the one that really suffered the most. Now, uh, next page three. <clears throat> uh, yeah. Aside from Aiko 
Herzak, like gentleman named Fred Korematsu. There was another man named Gordon Hirabayashi and Minoru uh, Matsui. These three gentlemen defied mm -hmm. uh, the uh, government order to go into an internment camp. And they had fought Supreme Court, but had lost. And, and you know, uh, when Supreme Court ruled this unconstitutional in the year 2018, they had died. But they they left a, a uh, past saying, you know, they taught us uh, the civil rights hero movements, uh, the Constitution, global human rights, and story also connects the present day civil rights discrimination, political scapegoating, and such as mass incarceration and anti-immigrant sentiment. Now, the Fred Korematsu Day of Civil Liberties and Constitution was passed in several states. Uh, let me uh, mention them to you. Uh, they were passed in perpetuity to California, Hawaii, Virginia, Florida, Arizona, and New York City. The one that was passed by New York City, I was one of the, I, I gave a testimonial on this. And also uh, more recently, uh, we started registering uh, one in New Jersey. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we passed the uh, assembly on vote of 76 to zero. We are waiting for the Senate, state Senate to vote to make this a perpetuity uh, for the, the, for the uh, Day of Civil Liberties Constitution. Uh, myself and I, we spent a lot of time in Fort Lee, New Jersey. Actually, this is a place I came back from Vietnam with PTSD and, and I was exposed to Asian Orange, but we were able to pass this overnight while other states, I mean, it just takes forever. The one I'm working on, New Jersey, is has taken over a year and a half, but uh, they were able to pass it. And the mayor of Fort Lee says, this is no brainer. I mean, <laughs> how can it be so difficult? But anyway, we're able to pass it and we're able to uh, celebrate the third year this year. But hopefully, state of New Jersey will pass this very, very soon. We need these type of events so that no other American we suffer what we have suffered. And this is very important for us. And this proclamation is the one that uh, uh, Mayor uh, Forley uh, wrote down for us. Okay, uh, next uh, section, please. Now, I want to get into actual experiences with our family. As you know, back in the early 19, 1900s, there was a Chinese Ex Exclusion Act. There was a Japanese Exclusion Act. This is a picture of my father, uh, probably 1913 to 1914. Uh, <clears throat> he grew up in Hiroshima, Japan. I came over here to this place 35 years later, but this picture is, he was about uh, nine, 10 years old. He never realized when he came here, when he was 13 years old, all these difficult lives were ahead of him. But uh, I'll be talking about our family now a little bit. As it says, uh, uh, he was left uh, at age three when my grandparents came to Florin, Sacramento, California to grow strawberry. At that time, as many other immigrants, uh, you know, dream, um, American dream, but it didn't really you know, uh, pan out for them. But my father did, was able to uh, dream the American dream. Next page, please. When he came on this boat, 1921, uh, the uh, Spanish flu was just over, 1921. Spanish flu lasted three months and our uh, coronavirus lasted two years. They didn't have vaccine then, but he did uh, take about three uh, three years uh, to be able to, uh, you know, finish that. But uh, when my father came at age 13, my, my parents had two younger brothers 
and two, uh, one young sister. So when he went, he was able to spend just one year, he was able to spend uh, uh, eighth grade uh, in Florida, California, uh, because, because of the pandemic, uh, the economy in the United States was very poor. So he had, at age 14, had to leave the house, carrying the blanket, become a migrant farmer. My father was a migrant farmer, just like any other immigrant. They come over here with a dream. They really work hard to realize that particular dream. As I mentioned before, with the Japanese exclusion uh, school that he attended, first to eighth grade in Florida, California was segregated, just like blacks are, were segregated uh, a while back. Uh, his school was also segregated. And also he could not marry internationally. He could not marry anybody. So he went back to Japan to marry my mother, call arrange marriage. But they had to go through this. But you know, this country, yeah, new kid in the block, I have a hard time. But we overcome this to our, you know, dream our American dream. Next, next page, please. Uh, this was in 1938. After 17 years of hard work at age 14 to this point, he worked hard to establish this produce business, a wholesaler, and he had 26 men working him, working under him. He was able to dream his American dream. But six years later, or the four years later, he lost everything because we were in turn because of the executive order 9066. But he had never lost the focus on us, us kids, that America has a great chance. And I will get to this as we talk about Hiroshima, as we go back to South Central Los Angeles, how he kept his focus on us to study hard to realize our American dream. Well, next page, please. Now, this is Santa Anita racetrack. This was in 1942 May. While they were building uh, 10 different internment camps, uh, they had us who's, who lived near Los Angeles into this Santa Anita racetrack. I remember one of my sisters saying, you know, during the summertime, the smell, the stench, of a whole stable was unbearable. This was not fit to be a camp for the human being. But we were, the, oh, my family was there because I was born a little after this. But this was a camp that our family went with just the one carry-on luggage and 10 days notice. Next page, please. This is a camp called Lower Arkansas. This is the furthest east the camp was built. As I mentioned before, they built the remote in the remote areas of different states. So no, so we were not conspicuous to everybody else. They stayed here for, for about a year. And when the, uh, the United States government <clears throat> wanted to hear our loyalty, they had loyalty questions. Specifically, <clears throat> 28 and 20, I mean, 27 and 28. And they would say, uh, would you disavow Emperor of Japan? And also the question was, would you willfully join the United States Armed Forces to defend this country? My parents says, no to both. First, he lost everything. He had four dollars. I must spend uh, in my mother's womb by this time. Uh, and he said, no, okay. And another question, like I mentioned, would you disavow Emperor of Japan? My mother's side and my father's side, their parents, my grandparents lived in Hiroshima, Japan. If they would disavow Emperor of Japan, they were never able to go back. So they answered no, no to these questions. These are very unfair questions 
to divide the uh, Japanese community within the internment camp. But they answered no and no. And anybody who had answered no, no to this question uh, were sent to Turtle Lake segregation camp, which I'm going to get into next. Now, okay, next page. Oh, before I get into Turtle Lake segregation camp, I want to mention other 90% who answered yes, yes. Among the uh, people who answered yes, yes, there were young Japanese American, I would say, I don't say kids, but they had volunteered in the United States Army. First two years, they had volunteered, but they would not let them fight. But finally, President uh, Roosevelt broke down and they were able to fight. And did you know, they had become the most decorated uh, unit in entire history of the United States. They were like, or security blanket until 1978 when Aiko Herzak discovered the fabricated report. We had to lean on somebody. They were our heroes. We kind of lean on them. Look at, you know, what our young men did, you know? So, well, this was a, a poster stamp that was unveiled last year, June 3rd. Uh, and this is first time the uh, Japanese American soldier was displayed understand. Also, this will give history of the internment camp, the executive order 9066. This is a very, very important stamp that will be here permanently forever. This is, a, by the way, is a forever stamp. Like I mentioned, 90% had answered yes, yes. They didn't want to rock the boat. And they, you know, they had no place to go. They're Americans, you know, but for our parents answered no and no, and we ended up in through the segregation camp. You saw the guard power. Uh, okay, next page, please. Now, I finally come into the picture. This is me, October, well, I was born on October 20th, 1944. Oh, by the way, that the, the panda bear, that came all the way back together to Hiroshima, Japan. And when I saw this picture, I was shocked to see how white this particular panda bear is because the panda bear I remember in Hiroshima, Japan was dark gray. I guess nobody had watched it, but I don't know where this panda bear went, but that was very, very special to me. That was me, I had hair. Look at me today, I don't have any hair left. But the, uh, the picture next to it, this is a passport picture that before we went back to Hiroshima, Japan, our parents decided to go back. And that turned out to be a tacit deportation, which I'll get into a little bit later on. Next page, please. Uh, this is uh, the last picture we took uh, together as a family before we went back, uh, before we were released. Uh, you could see me uh, sitting on my father's lap and my four uh, other sisters. One of the sisters missed the picture, so she wanted to uh, make sure that she's getting into it. So that was her. So I had four older sisters, and I was the only son. Can you imagine me being born only son, especially with the Asian family? They must have a party. I, I, I never, I, I had forgotten to ask that question. Did you have party for me when I was born in the camp? But uh, I'll. I'll get the answer next time. Okay, next page, please. This is the boat that took us back, the tacit deportation back to Hiroshima, Japan, not Hiroshima. This is from Portland, Oregon to Yokosuka in uh, near Yokohama. Uh, this was an army transport ship called USS General Gordon. This carried about 5,000 people. Actually, out of the 18,000 that lived in Turtle Lake segregation camp, only 4,000 of us went back. After uh, Japan lost the war, a lot of people had decided not to go back. But 4,000 of, 4, of us did go back to Japan. Uh, I know my uncle who were interned and my, my uh, cousin who was born in the camp never came back. So probably half of us came back to the United States. 
but uh, this was the transport ship that took us back. And my mother was an American citizen. Her passport or her citizenship was taken away. Anybody who went back to Japan, and if you have American uh, American citizenship, if you were uh, in over eighteen, you lost your citizenship. Very unfair because we shouldn't have been in the camp in the first place. But that is what happened to us. But we found a loophole in 1952 when my sister turned uh, 21. She was able to recall our parents back. Uh, and one by one, we came back. 1952, my oldest sister, Mary, came back. 1953, my second oldest sister, Lillian, came back. And finally, my father, 1954, came back. He was a social supporter, so that was very important. In 1955, my other sister, Margie, came back. And finally, myself, my other sister, fourth sister, and, and my mother came back. When we united in San Francisco, uh, this was, at that time, that I was just a little kid, was the happiest moment in my life. Uh, next page, please. This is what we went back to uh, four months after the atomic bomb dropped in Hiroshima, Japan. This bomb evaporated 150 innocent people overnight. And you know what? <clears throat> after <clears throat> knowing <clears throat> what, what they did, they dropped another bomb in Nagasaki and killed another 90,000 innocent, they evaporated another 90,000. This is what nuclear weapon does. Now, Putin is talking about nuclear weapon. Well, that's what this does. It just flattens the city and kills a lot of innocent people. And uh, I just wanted to bring this up because uh, nuclear weapon is no way to go. And what we've been doing since I did grow up in Hiroshima, Japan, uh, for the last 28 years, we organized uh, Hiroshima Kai, and we go silent march. In fact, there's 30 pictures of victim of atomic bomb inside my garage in the placard that we always carry. And we have a silent march, and we read the decoration of the mayor, which is in essence the decoration of Hibakusha, which is a victim of atomic bomb. And uh, we've been doing this in New York City for the past 28 years to show what devastation that nuclear weapon does. And the last two years, because of the coronavirus, we couldn't do it, but probably start again this year. But this is the place where that uh, we did go back to in Hiroshima. And uh, my father uh, and my mother, they had their parents living there. so. They want to make sure they're safe. Uh, but uh, that was the reason. And also, my sisters were learning actually Japanese language, Japanese culture, Japanese history. They were even singing uh, Japanese uh, war song in uh, uh, Turtle Lake. I mean, and that's how bad they wanted to come back because of all the treatment they received. At that time, where we, were labeled as the bad guys, even though that bad guys was the guy who fabricated a report and put us in the camp in the first place. Next page, please. But this is where we went back to. You can see the atomic bomb uh, was dropped, the dome, uh, and the Dambara is uh, way below. That's where my, my, my mother's side lived, about a mile from the uh, epicenter. And where I live was about eight miles uh, from the epicenter. This is where I grew up. I remember uh, we had volleyball games and they talk about the remnants of uh, nuclear weapon. We used to play volleyball third, fourth, fifth grade uh, intercity. And one of the teams, we didn't have uniforms those days. And one of the teams would take the shirt off. And you could see as you get closer to the city of intercity elementary school, you could see more burns on your body. At that time, I was only about nine, 10 years old. 
I mean, I really, you know, didn't know what it was about, but it was, it was a burn from the atomic bomb. But uh, anyway, this picture show where my father was in Nishihara, the picture with a cow. That's where Nishihara was, about eight miles from the epicenter. But this is where we lived in Hiroshima, Japan, uh, uh, from, from eight to 10 years uh, of our lives. Okay, next page, please. Uh, now, I come in the picture again. This is myself, uh, uh, five, six years old, uh, living in, in Hiroshima, Japan. Uh, we didn't have not too much sleep. You could see how skinny I was. We're so happy to get care package from our relatives or organization from the United States. And I would like to kind of share a couple of stories about the care package. Uh, whenever we got a care package, just like B going to the, <clears throat> the uh, flowers, my four older sisters go after it and they're going to get their hands on their candy. And me being the smallest in the run of the family, I was the last one to get there. But always, always, my aunt, who had lived in Hornham in a Swiss shop, she was working on a laundromat. She was, i send us sweaters, candies, you could name it, coffee, so that somehow we could make, make a living. And like coffee, for example, my mother used to go into New York, uh, Hiroshima City to exchange that to bread or rice so we could eat. Now, I remember one time uh, I got myself a nice cowboy outfit with a cowboy hat and, and a holster and a gun. And I would go out to the neighbors and start bragging, you know, I have the really rich aunt who lives in the United States. Look what, what they sent me. That was cowboy outfit with gun and everything. And again, I wanted to brag two, three days later. And I asked my mother, uh, where is that uh, the toy I got? And she would not answer. She was quiet. And I would cry all day long because I promised my friend, you get to use my gun. But, but uh, I found out that she went to the black market to sell my uh, cowboy outfit. That's how, how we lived those days. This was in uh, 19, uh, this was the 1940s, towards the end of 1940s. And another story is that about the uh, care package, about the marbles. And when you go back to Japan those days, we become an outcast uh, because we were foreigners. And I could not make friends to play with. But whenever this marble came and I had this cloth of marbles, Beautiful color marbles and kids in Japan then had. And I knew how to use, I knew how to pedal these beautiful marbles so that I get to make friends. I get to play with them. Sure enough, I got to play with them, but I'd go home with the empty sack of the bag without any marbles. And my mother used to say, Takeshi, what happened to your marbles? Well, I would. I would uh, smirk and I was in cloud nine. The fact that I was able to play with our neighboring kids. That, that was the days that I remember in Hiroshima. Also, uh, uh, I remember, oh, go to the next page, please. <clears throat> uh, this is my classmate in fifth grade. When we were about third or fourth grade. We went to see, uh, uh, as a social study class, a film called Hiroshima, it's a very gory story about uh, a bomb being dropped and all these uh, uh, victims are being carried away to the hospital and so forth. And one of the girls uh, started to cry. And uh, I still remember she wouldn't stop crying. Apparently she saw maybe her last name written on, on, on the list of people who, uh, who's there. I mean, they were being carried away by the Red Cross uh, to the hospitals. And, and uh, uh, I remember something like that. Uh, also, uh, my uncle, I used to remember his half the body 
was burnt. And uh, my mother said, uh, if you see his body, don't say anything, don't look away, but just act normal. You know, those days, anybody who was exposed to uh, the nuclear weapon uh, radiation, you could not get partners to get married. My uncle finally married another victim of atomic bomb to get married. Well, this is what it does. When you see Russia, Ukraine talk about uh, nuclear weapons, this is what happens, you know? So, but back to this picture here. Uh, when President Obama came to Japan to pay respect to the victim of, the, of atomic bomb about 60 years ago, I went back to this particular school uh, 65 years later, and I talked about peace and, and, and war and peace. And war, because I was, I uh, experienced Vietnam War, peace, well, uh, Japan at that time was uh, enjoying peace. Uh, and uh, somebody, wrote the article about me giving a speech and one of my classmates discovered me in the newspaper and uh, gave the uh, information to our teacher. The teacher over here at that time, he was about 27 when, and we had the, uh, a class reunion uh, three years ago. He was about 90, 92. So there was 10 of us and him, and we had a reunion. That was a very, very uh, happy moment. Uh, next page, please. Now, this is uh, in 1957, when we came back to the United States in 1956, when I was in sixth grade. This is our graduation picture. We live in South Central Los Angeles. Even at the time, us Japanese Americans stirred in undesirable areas. Today, this area is the gang capital of the world, but uh, it's, uh, uh, I lived in Hiroshima, I mean, uh, South Central LA, these kids became my friends overnight. I, I had absolutely no problem. And later on, uh, when I was in Vietnam, uh, I'll tell you a story about Vietnam. There's a lot of blacks fighting for this country and uh, they became good friends. They became my bodyguards. I, I'll tell you about that a little bit later on. Next page, please. Mm. Uh, <clears throat> I like to briefly mention this because during six months, right after I came back from Vietnam, 1971, I, I spent six months in isolation because I came back with PTSD. Uh, there was different person inside of me. Uh, if you know what I'm talking about, PTSD or being exposed to Asian Orange, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You didn't want to be sympathized. You just want to get away. You just didn't want to, be, you want to be left alone. Uh, I just wanted to show you this because in 1959, the lady, the uh, aunt who gave us uh, uh, care packages lived in New York and she opened the first, uh, second Japanese uh, restaurant in New York City. We came to help for three months. At that time, uh, during the summertime, I joined the Boy Scout and I attended the Boy Scout camp at the Rondock. I just wanted to uh, show you this picture so that uh, uh, you know where I was coming from when I came to New York for my isolation. <clears throat> Next page, please. All of us, uh, because my father never lost the focus in America. He believed in America. All of us study hard. Of course, my father uh, in Japan, he worked seven days a week. When he came back here, he worked six, seven days a week so that all of us have good education. My sister, one of my sisters became a doctor. Uh, my other sister became high school teacher. My other sister became a beautician. One of my sisters helped me build Furu Uh And so all of us were able to realize our American dream. We did, we did study hard and we really worked hard. I wanted to show you the picture, what the result can be done. Thank you. Next page. Again, we, we kept on trying. I didn't want to be just a private when I went to Vietnam War. I wanted to become an officer. After graduating from college, I went to officer candidate school and I was kind of chicken. I wanted to be 
be behind the line. So I volunteered to go to engineering officer candidate school. But, but our entire class, uh, because President Nixon was about to uh, bring everybody back to uh, <clears throat> to uh, United States. So we were uh, commissioned as intelligence officers. We became advisors <clears throat> to national police in Vietnam. Next page, please. Uh, this is a class that graduated. There was only three minorities in class, myself and the lower uh, left-hand corner. Uh, and next to me was a Filipino kid. And at the top, there's one black kid. There's all uh, three minorities in our group. Next, please. This is where I was stationed, Duke Way, Haunia province, adjacent to Beresfield, right adjacent to uh, Cambodia. In May of 1971, uh, President Nixon, without congressional orders, went secretly into Cambodia. And uh, I was there at the time. And the gentleman next to me was my uh, superior officer, Major Ebby. The previous one uh, was ambushed, was sent back to the United States because he hurt his, his leg. He almost lost it. But what I found out in Vietnam, I was kind of shocked. I thought I was back in South Central Los Angeles. My senior officer was black. My assistant in intelligence was black. My radio operator was black. But of course, we were in the, uh, the uh, uh, advisory group, uh, Team 43. Uh, but, uh, but whenever I have a problem with, with other uh, American soldiers and these black who I, I told you that I grew up in South Central. They'll come behind me, rally behind me, and protected me. It was, it was a good feeling. Next page, please. And uh, just before I came back uh, uh, on uh, January 1971, uh, I, I was awarded Bronze Star. Uh, next page, please. Uh, this is another story. Let me see. Oh, my goodness. The time's uh, going pretty fast. Let me quickly give my uh, story about her. I met her when I was in officer candidate school, and uh, I was attending Vietnamese uh, language school, and uh, I met her at a party, and, uh, and I, I, I actually uh, dated her before I went to Vietnam, and Actually, saw her my R and R when uh, six months in Vietnam. We usually get R and R about six months after you go there, uh, and I was able to spend time in Japan, and so I knew her very well. But uh, even at that time when I met her in uh, Japan, uh, person inside me was a little different. I was uh, under combat fatigues, and when I came back, I was really different. We kind of uh, lived apart for about six months or so, until I got a little lonely. I proposed to get married, but uh, she didn't say yes for the longest time. But when they would get married, she said, Tak, this is the biggest mistake I made in my life. And she was right, because I had PTSD, and she was my punching bag, not physically, because she was stronger than I am. But uh, uh, I would uh, pick on her, uh, but somehow she nursed me, and she supported me throughout. And today, without her, I'll be in streets of Manhattan begging like some other uh, uh, Vietnamese veterans, homeless. Next page, please. Uh, this is uh, uh, June 1974, three years after we got back. I could not hold a job. Any place I get a job, I get terminated because I could not focus on a job. If you get a PTSD, you, uh, you could not work, you don't function. But luckily, my wife and I were able to find a business that we started. And I happened to be in the right place at the right time when Japan become number two uh, economic power in the world. And I was able to sell buildings in Manhattan, golf courses and suburbs. And I was pinching myself every morning 
on my journey. And I, 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 I was very thankful that, that uh, I was in that situation. Next page, please. Uh, during my business uh, days, uh, I was able to cross path with Donald Trump. 1988, uh, our company was number one selling Trump towel. I mean, not Trump Park was a uh, conversion. Uh, Sixth Avenue and uh, Central Park uh, South, and uh, but I, he was very uh, condescending, so I kind of kept away from him. And uh, but one time he did contact me, 1992, too, and he says, "Tag, remember that guy you were going to introduce me to? That guy who bought Pebble Beach?" And I'm thinking, I, I, I wanted to take my princess to his big yacht he had. I'd like to sell it. So I, I gave him the phone number. That was the last, uh, first time, first and last time I got in contact with him. But uh, I, I kept distance with him. But uh, this was uh, one of my opportunities in 1988. Next page, please. Uh, Oprah Winfrey, there's another uh, famous person that I got in touch with because uh, in late 1980s, the early 1990s, uh, Japan was buying on hand. Japan was actually buying all, all the uh, trophy buildings in the United States. And, and I used to get interviewed by uh, you know, mass media, especially the New York Times. And one day the New York Times called me, Tech, you know, there's a Japanese bashing going on. Do you know anything about it? And, Have you ever been bashed? I said, well, you know, by, yeah, yeah, actually I was bashed uh, uh, last night, when I was at the uh, dinner together with my my good friend, just came back from Japan, he was president of one of the major uh, companies, and uh, uh, together with the neighbor uh, neighbors. At that time, uh, there were two older people looking at me, and uh, actually followed me all the way to the parking lot. They started yelling at me, and he was ramping and saying. You know, you Japs are buying up the United States, you know. You guys no good. And I said, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm Japanese American. I'm American. What the hell are you talking about? And then my, my, my clients start to come out, and I really wanted to uh, belt them, but I, I, I couldn't because of my, uh, my clients were there. Uh, so I was, uh, uh, I wouldn't say attacked, but I was, uh, yeah. Uh, involved in, in, in the bashing. And, and the New York Times article, which was a national, caught the eyes of uh, uh, Oprah Winfrey. And we were in Chicago. We were, uh, I was flown to Chicago and myself, uh, uh, first general of Japanese American, uh, also uh, JAC of Japanese American Citizens League. And he was uh, 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 president uh, of the chapter, uh, we were all uh, having a conversation or just a debate. Uh, and at that time, uh, this was the letter that I received from Oprah Winfrey thanking us for being at the show. Uh, this was my second bat, uh, uh, bashing that I had encountered in this country. Next page, please. Uh, I wanted to show you this article, which happened about uh, 12 years ago. Until this time, no other authority had thanked me for my service in Vietnam. And this was the first time I was awarded the Distinguished Service Medal. I was very happy. I, this is the day, first time that I start to open up about Vietnam. And uh, it was a very happy moment. Next page, please. Now, this was one, one of the many, many medals that we received. Next page, please. And my wife and I received the key to the borough of Fort Lee. We, we worked over there and uh, next year, uh, we'll be celebrating 49th year, oh, this year, 48th year, 
uh, and we got key to the uh, city of Fort Lee. I'm very thankful that we're there. Uh, okay, next page, please. Now, my story is so dark. Uh, talk about prejudice here, prejudice there. I just wanted to kind of line up everybody and uh, uh, talk about my romance a little bit. Uh, we've been married uh, about three, three months ago. We've been married for 50 years. And at the time, our good friend told us a, a poem about us. Now, I don't know how to do cha-cha-cha too well. And I, I, I was a shy. I mean, I don't know. I, I don't look shy probably today, but I was shy. I was very hesitant to ask uh, ladies to dance with me. We took about four or five uh, JB on the rock. JB, as you know, is a scotch. And uh, uh, I was uh, able to ask her to dance. Let me just uh, read this uh, for, uh, poem. Oh, the magic of the dance. It was cha-cha-cha that brought two hearts together who met all those years ago, a shy, handsome soldier and a very pretty young lady. This is their love story, something that happened over 50 years ago. Keep the music playing. May God bless you both. Uh, I thought you might like this because uh, today's story is kind of dark, but I wanted to say one thing. If you work, really work hard, this is a great country. The constitution really works. Even though it took 76 years to exonerate us as a bad guy. But anyway, the constitution does really work. And uh, now I like to uh, receive questions and answers. Uh, and I would like to have dialogue uh, with the people who are here today. And uh, uh, before I do that, I would like to uh, kind of introduce my wife. She recently had a problem with her, with her uh, eyes and, uh, and uh, she can see too well, uh, but uh, she has a black clot and uh, she really can't see too well. But anyway, she would like to say hello to you. <clears throat> Hi, how are you? Just thought I'd say hello and, you know, thank you for coming to hear my husband's uh, speech. Thank you. Okay, uh, I mean, there's so much to tell, but I just wanna kind of give you a highlight for when on during my life. Uh, but today uh, I wanted to talk about the executive order 9066. I wanted to talk about what happened to us uh, when we got married. Uh, I wanted to talk to you about my experiences uh, in Vietnam uh, and so forth. And I'm sure you have a lot of questions I try to answer as best as I can. Uh, I've been very fortunate to have a great parents who have supported me and sisters, my wife, uh, and I've been very lucky. I like to open up for questions. Yes, we'll open up for questions now. Let me just close this. Um, Yes, if, uh, if anybody in the audience would like to ask a question, uh, please drop them in the chat and I will um, read that, read them for TAC. Um, but yes, many people uh, have been saying, uh, thank you for your lecture, um, that they, uh, thank you for your, taking this time to come and talk to us and that it was very interesting. Um, well, as people are, are thinking of and putting questions into the chat, um, perhaps I, I'll start <laughs> uh, with asking you a question. Um, do you have anything maybe to, to say to people today that are, that might have a trouble believing in this sort of like American dream that you talk about that seems to be like, you know, this thread throughout yours and your family's lives um, that, you know, given a lot of, things happening in the world right now might be hard for people to sort of believe in. Like, what would you say to someone who's having like trouble sort of believing in that, that idea of America? Well, I've been blessed 
I, I had a very good family. I had a good parents, especially my father. He kept working hard. He would not give up. Uh, I, I knew he was successful at one time, but he could never come back. Uh, but he gave us, all of us, an education. All of us. He was a model to us. And looking at the parents, for us, was very important because he worked hard and, and, and educated us. And he understand what was going on. And uh, I'm very appreciative. And this country is very new. I mean, not too, too many countries go through this. I mean, we have opportunity, but you have to grab the opportunity. It's not easy. We're newcomers. We're not that easy to make everything happen. But yeah, you got to try. And I, I love this country because whatever you try, you get results if you, if you really try hard. But uh, I've been lucky to have very good parents, lucky to have my good sisters, and lucky to have good friends. And uh, that's the only thing I could say is that I've been a lucky, lucky person. Mm -hmm. Despite, you could tell, well, you know, you were born in a camp and you grew up in Hiroshima and you went to Vietnam War and you suffer Asian Orange and you, you come back with PTSD. What's so lucky about that? Well, you know, in between, you have to, you have to live. Mm. You cannot give up. But you keep on living. You get someplace. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, I've been very fortunate. Thank you. Yes, th thank you so much for that. Um, all right, so we do have a question in the chat. Um, Sarani asks, uh, if this isn't too personal, I was wondering if you could talk about the effect your exposure to Agent Orange has. My grandfather was a Vietnam War vet and he never talked about his experiences at all, at all because of his PTSD. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story and thank you for your service. Um, if you do feel comfortable talking about that further, um, please. Well, you know, uh, 12 years ago, state of New Jersey, uh, you know, gave us the opportunity and says, thank you. This was first time doing, after I came back from Vietnam, any official, the government official said, thank you for serving our country. It made me feel good. And from that time, I was able to kind of open up a little bit. Until then, it was very difficult because when you came back, they would spit at us. I mean, you went to war. Why did you do that? I mean, it is our responsibility. It is our duty to do that. And, uh, you know, if I had to do it again as, as the citizens of America, I'll do it again. But, uh, uh, you know, uh, 12 years ago, uh, New Jersey, city of New Jersey did give us award thanking us, which is very, very important for us. You know, I mean, we came back as, as a double, you know, just like Japanese, uh, when they came back a war, I mean, their, their wives and everybody else, I mean, why did you come home alive? You know, that type of thing. But, you know, serving the country is important. What would you do if your wife or kids are getting beaten up? Would you go hide in a closet? I don't think so. You defend them. Well, that's exactly what I did. Uh, yes, thank, thank you for, for that. Uh, sorry, I'm checking the chat. Um, if anyone has any, any further questions. Um, uh, Carlina asked, or first they say, thank you so much for your story, Mr. Fudimoto. Um, as young people today, are there things that you think we can do or that we can keep in mind to prevent injustices uh, like what you experienced from happening again with the current state of the world, it can be hard to feel like we can make a difference. Well, I think everybody's a little different. Uh, everybody do their part. I mean, for me, uh, I, I'm still alive, coming back from Vietnam, talk about it. Also. Uh, Hiroshima, I did not, I'm not exposed to, to uh, atomic bombing. However, I was exposed to Agent Orange. I know how it feels. Uh, uh, 
you know, uh, but uh, all of us uh, have to do our part uh, and uh, we have to make this world better. I mean, for us to live in, we have to go forward. And, and by doing it, we do make this country better. Uh, uh, so I don't know, uh, it's a cheerleading rah, 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 but still, uh, uh, I believe in this country. My father did. And I'm glad what he did. He came back. And despite all the negatives, he says, you know, you keep on working hard. You're going to get someplace. And, you know, this country is all about that. You know, uh, you start uh, as a new kid in the block. Yes. Some people have it harder uh, than others. But still, this country does give an opportunity if you really try. Uh, I happen to be very lucky. I had very good parents, and I was able to find the right person to marry. Even though she said, "Tack," it was the worst, you know, thing I did in my life. I mean, she she had a hard time because first eight years. I mean, I was there. There's different person inside of me. It wasn't me, but uh, can't help it. You know, you had to. Uh, defend yourself and either you or him, the other guy. So, but, you know, it's part of life and uh, we all go through it. Mm -hmm. um, we have another question from Edwin. How long did it take for Furimoto Realty to thrive to what it is now uh, other than hate? What was another challenge that you faced? Well, uh, <clears throat> initially, uh, you know, I mean, I didn't have any money. I had really no money. I started in a hundred dollars a month uh, office. And uh, so, you no, know, we had a hard time, but in uh, late seventies, early eighties, Japan, early eighties, actually, Japan became number two economic power. And every morning in my basement office, I would be pinching my, my cheek and said, am I dreaming? Is this true? I thought when I op opened the office because I couldn't hold a job, I thought, well, I'd be in this basement office for my entire life. No, it, it, it changed everything, but hey, you know, you had to have some luck once in a while, but it was lucky. Uh, there's no question about it. Uh, like my father, he was unlucky. Uh, he, he really had an opportunity uh, to let, let his business grow. The war came and he lost everything, but. He believed, you know, but he gives us kids, us siblings, you know, we got an education and we're very thankful that we do. And this, this is one of the few countries that gives that opportunity, which I think is very important. You know, some other countries, you don't have this opportunity as much as we do. And we have to look at positive. There's a lot of negative in the world, in this country, but we have to look at positive. And we have to go forward. You cannot go backward. You cannot. Sometimes you have to burn the bridge behind you. Just keep on going. And you have to do that. But, uh, you know, it could be a good country. I mean, really. Mm -hmm. well, it is a good country. Not it could be. It is a great country. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So, yeah. Thank you for for talking about that. And thank you again for sharing your entire story. Again, many, many students have, have said in, in, your, in the chat that your story was very moving and thank you for, for sharing that. And thank you for your service as well. Um, you know, obviously we've, I've asked you to come back to this class again. So I do think that your story is really important. Um, and I mean, obviously still relevant um, today and what's going on. Um, and as you mentioned at the beginning uh, of your, your speech, you know, remembering these things and making sure that they, so that we can make sure that they don't happen again um, is also very important. Um, so we, we are almost out of time uh, for the event today. Uh, so uh, well, of course, one more time, thank you very much, Tack, uh, for coming and speaking to us. Um, thank you to everyone who attended the event. Um, obviously, I have a lot of people from my class, and I hope that they all got a lot out of this. Um, and yeah, that is, that's it for the event. Um, unless you have any sort of final words, Tack, that you want to, to leave us with, or? Yes, uh, uh, you know, history is very important. Your class, April, is very important. 
yeah. make sure it doesn't repeat itself. Yes. But it does. But you have to really study history. Mm -hmm. Sometimes uh, registration, I, I'm in Jersey, and sometimes, you know, you have to keep on pushing. The assembly voted 76 to nothing, but actually they sat on the bill for about a year after Senate actually passed it. And all they had to do is pass it, but we, we had to wait one year. But still, you have to keep on fighting. But registration is important because from the top comes, you know, a good orders. So that is very important. Okay. Uh, another thing, the events like Fred Korematsu Day events so that, that they're recognized this particular day. And also, uh, thanks for giving me opportunity lectures. I mean, yes. what I could share with them. I mean, I'm not a historian. I mean, only thing I could say is what happened to my, my parents, what happened to my sisters and this and that, but whatever I could share the story, mm -hmm. uh, it's very important, the lectures. These are the things that, you know, uh, we can do and to safeguard our constitution, you know, uh, our constitution, civil liberties, so important. I mean, people around it, they're trying to move this constitution. It is written in stone. We have to protect it, safeguard it. And that's very important. And tell the public what's going on and, and don't be shy about it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you so much. Um, very important uh, things for all of us to remember. Um, yeah, and, and that is it for today. Um, yes, thank you so much again. Thank you, April. Thanks. And thank you. Uh, I, I was hoping that maybe someday we could have a dialogue together so we could see eye to eye. <laughs> yes. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully, hopefully next time you talk, it can be in person. Thank you, April, for the opportunity. Thank you. All right.